morning, Bridgepoint Church. Thank y'all for being here this morning. Uh, to everybody out here in the audience who may watch me us worldwide, we thank you. We're glad you chose to worship with us this morning because you could have chosen a lot of other places. We're really glad you're here with us today. Um, if you have a moment, would you like and uh, share our Facebook page and share our worship with that with everybody in the world, Lord? It'd be uh, really great and powerful to everybody hear our word today. So I've been told I'm talking too softly. Um, so if, they, if y'all can go like and share there out in Facebook world. But my name is Austin Hemshoot. I am a part of our singles ministry here at uh, Bridgepoint Church. So uh, thank you. So here at Bridgepoint, we are all about building bridges and breaking barriers. And the singles had a great opportunity to do that this week with the Love Thy Neighbor Challenge. Thank you, Everett. Yep. <laughs> so with the uh, Love Thy Neighbor Challenge, what the focus was is to go out there and encourage each other over the, the course of a week. That could be a text with someone, that could be a phone call, that could be a gift you give out to anyone, just so you can help encourage all those singles out there. We base this off of Hebrews 3, 12, 13. And Hebrews 3, 12, 13 reads, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So we have the opportunity to go and share that daily. Uh, I myself... You know, I, uh, with this challenge, you know, it's uh, building bridges and breaking barriers here at Bridgepoint. And I was able to break a few barriers in my life because I'm not one to talk that much. This is a big step for me. Most of you already know that. But uh, I took that chance this week and I decided to go talk to people in my group for the Love by Neighbor Challenge. And I would call people daily. I had luckily had eight people in my group, including myself, so that gave me one person to call each day. And that kind of helped build bridges with connections with new people around the church. You know, I helped find out that, uh, you know, Tosin Nwade, he's out there crushing a PhD program, working on his dissertation. I found out that uh, Coco Thomas is uh, a little bit of a daredevil growing up. I found out that uh, Miss Eleanor Crawford, her favorite color is the rainbow. <laughs> and then finally, one other thing I learned is that, uh, well, I made a challenge with Adjua Anand that uh, we would go and walk the, uh, go up and walk Stone Mountain. And I found out that uh, I might not know what I've gotten myself into, but looking forward to doing that with her. So I've built a few connections with that, and I know other singles have done that out there as well. So I did want to say that I was going to go up here and share with Jennifer Goodwin this morning. She's been having a little car trouble. So if y'all could please be praying for her as she uh, gets that worked out so she can be here next Sunday. But uh, it's kind of ironic because I've been having car trouble with myself the past couple weeks. And that's what I asked some people to pray about over the course of this week for the challenge and I was able to come here this morning in my car. So see how that works out? So uh, we're gonna go to a video for our Black History Moment. It'll be about Senator John Lewis. So if you can just please stay seated and we'll go from there. Thank you guys. Good morning, Bridgepoint Church. My name is Marv Richardson, and I have the opportunity of doing the Black History Month moment this morning. Today, I will be highlighting Mr. John Lewis. John Robert Lewis, uh, congressman and civil rights leader, uh, was born in Troy, Alabama, or near Troy, Alabama. And at early age, he loved reading books. He would read any book he could get his hands on. Um, he also was, at an early age, wanted to be a preacher. So much so that he would actually preach to his family farm's chickens. No, no lie, he would actually preach to the chickens uh, if no one was around. Um, it reminds me of the scripture uh, the Lord says, if you don't praise me, the rocks will rise. So he would preach to the chickens. Um, as I mentioned, he loved reading books. And when he, at the age of 16, he would go with his friends to a public library to get a library card and would be denied to get a library card because of the color of his skin. In college at Fisk University, he would help found the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And this committee would help organize marches and freedom rides throughout the United States, particularly in the Southeast. And it is in that um, committee and organizing marches that he would do uh, a march from Selma to Montgomery that uh, that would be, one of those marches would be known as Bloody Sunday when they were attempting to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. That occurred in 1965. 
after that, uh, and, and, and it really caught the nation, the pulse of the nation, there was change that created from that. He uh, changed his aspirations from being a preacher to going into politics. And in 1977, fast forwarding, he actually ran for the 5th Congressional District Office here in Atlanta, Georgia. He would actually lose in 1977. And then eight, eight to nine years later, he would run again for that same position, and he would win it. I just find it interesting, this, this icon of a man still faced many challenges, even to win a, 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 a district um, office you know, in, in, here in Atlanta, Georgia. But he was a fighter, and once he won that um, position, he would hold it for the next 17 terms. John Lewis is an American hero, uh, an incredible African-American. Uh, he would win the, or, or earn, uh, my, let me correct myself, earn the Presidential um, Medal of Honor uh, that he received from President Obama. He was known as the conscience of Congress. He was also very passionate about good trouble is necessary trouble. John Lewis is someone that we want to recognize and never forget. He was, he died in 2020 and uh, was respected and loved by many. So today we just want to just take some time to honor Mr. John Lewis. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's interesting. I've been doing this since October, and every Sunday I have to ask Elder Rankin on my neck. <laughs> and Austin, don't, don't, don't worry about um, not speaking loud. There's enough brothers that talk too loud anyway, so <laughs> you are a welcome change. Man, we want to welcome the Richardsons back all the way from Houston, Texas. Marv got a different haircut. Oh, that's the, that's the uh, partner haircut. That's I got to be in person haircut. So welcome back, guys. We're so grateful that God allowed you the space to go to Houston. We know how important it is to be around family. But we're so grateful that God has brought you guys back here. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father God in heaven, you are truly an awesome God. Thank you for your love, your compassion, your grace and your mercy. Father, there are so many needs that we have. Father, we have lost many loved ones. I want to pray for Paul Elder and his family. They lost their mom and they will be having a home going service this Tuesday. We pray that you will be with them, that you will protect them and watch over them. We pray for Jarrell Jones, whose sister lost her husband, that you will be with them. Father, we pray that we know that there's some sicknesses going on, and we pray that you will meet those needs. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you, Father. We pray that this service is a, um, we, that we will worship you in spirit and truth. Use me as your tool and as your vessel. And Father, we want to pray for our country and for our world, that you will use us as a light shining in a dark place. Help us to be less so that you can be more. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Wow, man, had a great chance to go to a um, birthday party yesterday. One of my childhood friends, uh, it was uh, myself. So they, they, they live probably about five miles away. So it was uh, me, my cousin Andre, and Todd and Donovan. We were, we were kind of like the four amigos. So whenever we would play sports, it would be my cousin and Donovan because they thought they were like, you know, kind of cutish and all that type of stuff. They, little fly. And me and Ty, we were kind of the, the grumpy old guys. So their mom moved here a couple years ago, and she had her 80th birthday party. So we had a chance to celebrate that. But something that was interesting, my cousin graduated from Hampton in 1985. And we had a chance. So we all went to the graduation. So in 1985, I was... 
21, had a chance to see a picture of all three of our parents at the beach. So that means they were like 40 years old. So we were talking like that, whoa, whoa, where was this picture at? It was at the same graduation, we said, well, why weren't we invited? I mean, because I'm like, wow, my mom, she's having a real good time. I've never seen my mom have that type of good time. My mom at the beach in the water? Man, my mom was so overprotective, it was. But anyway, so we asked Mrs. Shit, like, why didn't we get invited to this? Like, well, it was no kids allowed. I'm like, oh, I got you. And for those who, of us who are empty nesters, we understand what it means no kids allowed. Amen? <laughs> Turn your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 1. And again, we're still setting the foundation for repentance. And today we're just going to talk about being created in God's image and what that means. Being an image bearer of God. Do we understand the opportunities, but the huge ramifications of what that means? And being, image, and being an image bearer of God has nothing to do with whether you're a Christian or not. God has still called us to be. And so many times we want to talk about what to do instead of before we understand who we are. It's vitally important that we understand who we are. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 24. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to his kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And then later when it reads, it says, and when God saw what he had created, he saw that it was good. Now, the note says, us created them. Now, I'm not going to get into the creation there about man and woman, but understand, guys, we have messed up our view of womanhood according to the scriptures. Now, that's a conversation for another day, but we study it out and understand what woman's role is and how she was created. She is not less than. As a matter of fact, when you state it out, it means that she is the same as, as opposite to, man, to a man. She is as superior to a guy. But that's a conversation for a whole nother day. That might take a month, that might take a year. Because I think the church, we have skewed how God sees women. And we have to repent. And we'll talk about that. Here we see this, this narrative in Genesis chapter, don't turn there, 1, 3 through 5, we see that God created light. 6 through 8, God created the atmosphere. 9 through 13, God created the waters, dry land, and vegetation. 14 through 19, God distributed light upon the earth to regulate day and night. 14 through 19, the seasons. 20 through 23, water and air. Verses 24 through 25, God created land animals. And now on the second half of the sixth day, God created us. The culmination, his masterpiece. Now, understand we read Genesis. It is not a science book. It's not a science book. Because, and, and, and we're not going to get into, was it a little seven days, or we're not going to get into all that, because if you read the there, there's some, there's some things that don't make sense. Because the way that we govern today is by, by, the, by, by the sun coming up, right? 
But we see that that happened for a couple of days. So how was days measured then? You have plants before you have light. But again, it's not a science book. So let's not try to read it as a science book. And science and God do not conflict. We just have to have the deeper understanding of it. Earth was completely filled. When God, when on that sixth day, God said, it is done. I have done everything that I need to do. So there was no more creation that had been left. Now we have to understand that, put you, try to put yourself in a situation of the first hearers of this message from Moses. They were enslaved people. And they were in a culture and a society where your worth was built upon what you do and not who you are. Now, I wish we have changed that narrative. But isn't that still how it is today? Don't we feel that our worth is based upon what we do instead of who we are? Think about when you meet someone. What's the first question they ask you? What do you do? What do you do instead of who you are? I remember going to Tuskegee, had an African history course. And the first day of class, the instructor asked us, who are you other than your name and the color of your skin? I was 18, I'm like this, is, oh, okay, this, is this an exam? This is the first day of class. I'm like, bro, this is like, this is way over my head. And what he was trying to get us to understand is that your color does not decide who you are. Your name does not decide who you are. Where we live does not decide who we are. The church we go to does not decide who we are. We are created in God's image, and God sees us as good. And we have to change the narrative, not just how the world sees us, but how we see other people. The image of God is the reflection the likeness, the similarity of God. You have this concept, concept, Imago Dei. And there's a lot of theologians that have a lot of different thought processes about it, but it's talking about the image of God. So we say that we're the image of God, what does that mean? Also, when we, see, when we look in that verse, we have this plurality of creation us. And some scholars believe that it's talking about the Trinity. The only challenge with that is that word is not in the Bible. The concept of the Trinity, there's a concept, but the word is not in the Bible. So even back then, when you would say the Trinity, they would have no idea what you were talking about. They would know you're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, but this concept of Trinity, they didn't know about. Some, just some thought processes about the Trinity. It's a distinctive Christian doctrine. The Trinity is considered as a divine mystery beyond human comprehension to be, to be reflected upon only through scripture revelation. Have you ever tried to explain that? It's like ice and it's like water and it's like steam and it's like this, like God said, you know what? It's so profound, you don't even have to worry about all that. Just trust it. The Trinity is a biblical concept that expresses the dynamic character of God. Some scholars believe that that concept of the Trinity was not used until 168 AD. The concept of, the, of Trinity believes in one God, but it's also expressed when we look at Matthew 28, 19. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, where we see that three-part Godhead. When we talk about being created in God's image, there's a few things that I want us to look at. The first thing I want us to understand that we are spiritual beings. Look at Genesis chapter two. Verse seven, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Some scholars believe that human beings have three parts. And when we look at the scripture, we definitely see two. God was formed from the dust of the ground. 
and God breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of life. So even if we think about that basic concept that we were born from nothing, how dare us feel that we're better than somebody else? We're born from dirt, from clay. How dare we feel that we're more superior than someone else because we come from the same substance? Then it says that God breathed into his nostrils. But here we don't see where that human spirit comes. Look in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. Verse 27. It says, the lamp of the Lord searches the spirit of man. By this we see that God breathed this life into man. Our human spirit came into existence. Our human spirit is the deepest part of our innermost being. But why did God create us to have this spirit? It has to be something that is so much deeper. Look over in John chapter 4, verse 21. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. In order to contact or to worship God who is spirit, we must use our spirit, our innermost being, to worship God. Whether we're in this place or whether we're streaming live, we have to worship God in the spirit that he has created in us. We have to get back to that solid, deep worship, regardless of whether we're worshiping here or worshiping afar. And again, we'll talk about that, but I think we've gotten very, very comfortable in our worship. I think we like convenient worship. I mean, we like worship that the people look like me. It's the songs that I like to sing. We have to get back to, we're going to have to sing some songs that we're not comfortable with singing. We're going to have to consider singing some, some hymnals. Now I, love, now, I love Kirk Franklin, but there's some hymnals that's written in the 1800s that we're going to have to get back to singing some of those. We're going to say, oh, that's not my type of worship. Worship is about reverence. It's about falling down. It's about worshiping God, and we've got to, we've got to have some conversations about our worship. All of us have this innate need for God an empty vacuum which God can only fill. God created a spirit within each human being so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth are the scriptures. That spirit is that emotional part of worship. We have to be okay with that people worship God in many different ways. But sometimes, you know, I've been in worship services, I've seen something like, whoa, is that brother standing up? Whoa, whoa, wait. I don't know, boy. Some people like to say amen, some people don't. That's okay. However, the spirit of God that has been deposited in you allows you to worship, then you exercise the freedom to worship that way. Because if this is going to be a, a house of prayer for all nations, a house of worship, we have to allow people to express themselves in worship. If we're going to be a church that builds bridges and breaks barriers. Are we going to really be okay with the marginalized, the undesirables that made the mistakes to come in and worship our God? Are we, going to have, are we going to look at them side and say, whoa, 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 whoa. That seat's for the sanctified. You need to sit over there somewhere. Now, we won't say that. We won't say that. 
But we will act like that. We will respond like that. And sometimes I think that because right now we're, we're in a huge personal space type of environment, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. And sometimes I think we use this, this personal space thing to really have some personal space. And we want to talk about that as well. God has always created us to be relational beings. We are created to be in relationship. Matthew 22, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. God has created us to be in relationships. God has created us to be in community. And it is a very, very challenging time. Because I hate to tell you, I was watching something on the news. And they said there's something else coming that's more resistant to what we just went through. I'm like, you've got, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Something more resistant than what we just went through? But what have we learned over the last two years? That we need to be in community. Now, whether it's an in-person community or a virtual community, we need to be in community. We need to be in small groups. We need to be in one another relationships. You can call it discipling. You can call it one anothering. You can call it prayer partners. You can call it whatever. Now, I know for some, those are triggering words. Because we did make some mistakes. Discipling should not be a negative concept. Because it's teaching. When I'm taught something, I should feel positive about it. But we need to rethink how we do our one another times together. Just like you, I, I felt at times like, okay, so what did I do wrong this week? And I remember Shell and I were doing youth and family. And we went to, we went to rally. And we were sitting in with the middle schoolers. They said, you know what, the only time my parents opened the Bible is when I did something wrong. I'm like, whoa. When's the last time somebody sat down with you and said, bro, let me give you this, this scripture of encouragement. We don't do too good of a job of that, do we? But the Bible says encourage one another daily. Put courage into somebody. Now, we need to correct, we need to train, we need to rebuke. But we need to encourage. So discipling one another should not be a negative concept. Now, we're not at the point where we're saying that if you're not a part of a small group, you can't be a part of BPC. But my question would be, why wouldn't you want to be a part of a small group? That's the question. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of a campus? I'm like, well, let's go through the list. Brother A, you're not a part of a small group, so Brother A, uh, BPC is not for you. My question is, like, bro, you are missing out. You are missing out on what Austin and the singles had a chance to uh, witness last week. You are missing out. You are missing out on the glorious gifts that God has blessed you with to enrich someone else's life. You are missing out. But we have to have those conversations. We have to start talking about, to be in a relational community, we have to start talking about accountability. We have to have those conversations. Now, we can't lord it over someone. Someone has to invite you into that relationship. You have to set up what the expectations are going to be in that relationship. But we want to be a church that makes a change. We want to be a church that makes a difference. We want to be the people of God that's going to change the world and be a part of God's redemptive story. We have to be intimately involved in one of those lives. We have to have accountability and expectations. But it's not for me to set up your expectations. We have to agree upon those things. We're also rational beings. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and unfortunately, this slide is not up there. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of reason. God has created us with the ability to reason. There are certain times that someone will present you with something that just doesn't make good sense. Right? It, it just doesn't make any type of good logical sense. And you have to discern if that's a good decision or not. All right, brother, here's what we're going to do. Every Saturday morning, we're going to get up at 1 a.m. Now, bro, now, bro I know, I know y'all working three, four jobs. I, I know that. We're going to get up at 1, and we're going to walk to Stone Mountain. But we're going to meet at Kennesaw Mountain, and then we're going to walk to Stone Mountain. That's what, that, that's what we're going to do, brother, like this. Oh, man, that... That don't, that, don't sound, that don't sound too wise, brother. <laughs> or let's say, for instance, you have set up something in your mind. Say, okay, you know what? Every week by faith, this is what I'm going to give back to Bridgepoint. But then something comes up. You have a medical issue. You may need to go get some mental health help. And who you see, the practitioner you see, may be cash pay. Well, that means they don't accept your insurance. But you need to see that person to be better. So you're wrestling like, man, do I, I told God that I'm going to give this $50 every week. But man, I need this therapy, which is going to cost me $50. What do I do? I would hope we would say that. But some of us are so guilt-ridden. I made this vow and promise to God. And then my, 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 my mental health is declining and declining and it's affecting other aspects of my life. God has given you a spirit. God has given you a spirit of discernment. And that's what you need to do so that you can be the best version of yourself. Then that's what you should do. Like Austin said, man, if your car, look, if you got four flat tires and you need your car to get to work and you're paid hourly and you're on probation, which means you just started, 90 day probation, they said, look, if you late, you're going to lose this job. And, it's, and, and, right, and right now, it's coming up on May 1st. We have our special day of generosity. And you made this commitment. Hey, I'm going to give X amount of dollars. It's going to go to this. But I got four flat tires. Brother, go get them four flat tires fixed. The mission of God will still move forward. But I also have the other side of discernment. How big of a TV do I need? I mean, how big of a TV do I need? Now, now, you know what, man? I've got, you know what? You know we always have a, a live Super Bowl party. And God, look, God says use your wealth to influence your friends. So I'm going to get this. I'm not going to give to God, but I'm going to get this TV. You got to discern and figure that out. God has also designed us with free will. Look over Deuteronomy chapter 30. Starting at verse 15. See, I said before you today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I commanded you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering. Now, I love the first part of that passage. Don't we just wish that's how our walk with God was? That every time we read the Bible, 
or someone says, thus saith the Lord, man, we're going to follow it wholeheartedly. But God did not create us as robots. God created us with the ability to discern and to decide what we want to do. Verse 17. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day, I call it heaven and earth as witnesses against you that have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. Free will, man, is, 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 is it's a challenging concept, but we have to have it. Because if God created us as robots, if God forced us to follow him and submit to him, then what would love really look like? But sometimes the challenge comes when you're faithful and you're doing all these things and you feel that those who are not close to God are getting the blessings and you're getting the curses. But that goes back to last week that God is sovereign. God can bless who he chooses to bless. And we don't understand the mind of God. But sometimes, man, it makes me struggle. Like Paul said, when I want to do good, evil is right there with me. So I find this law at work. And a lot of times when we, we take the death route, it feels good in the interim, but we know long term it has consequences. That life is challenging at times, but that's the life that God wants us to live. Next, I think we were created as moral beings. Look in Leviticus chapter 19. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 20. Consecrate yourself and be holy because I, the Lord, your God, Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. God is holy. He has created us to be holy as well. We have consciences. And the more that we read the word of God, I believe the more that our conscience softens up. That when we see things and we hear things, it hurts us to the core. But the further we are away from God, you know, 1 Timothy talks about our conscience have been seared like with a hot iron. If you think about, take your hand and you put a hot iron on it. It's going to hurt. If you keep it there long enough, the skin is going to die and your nerves will be damaged. And you no longer have sensitivity in that hand. I remember a couple years ago, I had a pinched nerve in my neck. And it affected my right hand. And I'm right-handed. So even if I would try to lift something, it was literally like lifting like this. There were certain times I would reach out to grab something and I couldn't feel it. So it's the same concept when it comes to our consciences. The more we're in the word of God, the softer our conscience should feel, but the less we're away, with, uh, less we're away from God, our conscience gets seared, they get, our hearts get hard. Things that should bother us no longer bother us. I remember over the last two years, Sean and I were, man, we were, man, oh my gosh, we were news junkies because we had a COVID response team. So we're always looking at the news. Oh man, did you see this? And oh my gosh, what's this report? And what's the county going to do? What's the state going to do? What's this region going to do? And did you see what just happened there? I said, honey, you know what? I can't watch the news anymore. I just can't do it. Because I was watching more of the news and listening to the word of God. And my heart was getting hard. I was, I, was becoming, I was getting very, very angry. I wanted to go back to the Tuskegee mic. And that's a story for a whole nother day. The Tuskegee mic was not a nice guy. The Tuskegee mic, by any means necessary. The Tuskegee mic, if your skin color did not match mine, you would have some problems. 
the Tuskegee might say something sideways. We can go outside and talk about it. We, 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 we can do all that type of stuff. And I was feeling that way. But the challenge was I started feeling that way towards people in my congregation. You see some on Facebook like this. I don't believe that joker said that. Oh, wait until I see him on Sunday. Or I would do the great cutoff. You know what the great cutoff is, don't you? What type of Christian would fill in the blank? My conscience was no longer soft. I had to get back in the Word of God. I had to be more in tune with the Word of God than cable news network. Morality. Without moral will, one cannot have moral accountability. Next, we're responsible beings. Look over in Psalms 8. Verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with the glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the seas. God has charged us with have the dominion over the world. But with that responsibility comes a lot of things that we've got to be responsible for. Now, I'm not necessarily a person that's into ecology. I don't know if this is global warming or not. But I do know that I am a part of either the solution or the problem. By nature, I may not be a conservationist, so we're not going to go down that road. But we are responsible for our environment. We're responsible for this environment, which we're in here right now. So even if we think about that aspect of it, God has blessed us with a great facility. We have to be responsible for this space. If you see something, pick it up. If you break it, tell somebody. I mean, we'll get it fixed because it's expensive. But we've got to take care of what God has entrusted to our care. Again, there are consequences for being in the image of God. Last, we are emotional beings. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who lo loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our, for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made perfect in us. God is love. He has created all of us with the capacity to, to love. God chose to love us, and we're called to love one another. We're called to love people that we agree with and people that we disagree with. We are called to love unconditionally. We're called to have brotherly love. We're called to have passion love. Love is not an option. Some questions for us to ponder this week, and then we're going to transition into communion. And what I want us to think about is being an image bearer of God. So wherever we go, we are God's representatives. How does the fact that people are made in God's image affect the way that you feel about yourself? How does the fact 
that people are made in God's image affect the way that you feel about yourself? How does the fact that people are made in God's image affect the way you treat other people? How does the fact that people are made in God's image affect the way you treat other people? In what way do you need to change the way you treat other people since they're made in God's image? In what way do you need to change the way you treat other people since they are made in God's image? Let's pray, and then we're going to transition to communion. Dear Father God in heaven, thank you so very much for this chance to worship you. Father, we pray that we, are, that we understand that we are created in your image and that we have a responsibility to love as you've loved us. Help us to really look intently into your, into your word, into your law. Help us to cast aside all the divisions that separate the people of God. Because, Father, we truly believe that you have called us to build bridges and to break barriers. And the only way that's going to happen is that we will love the way that you've loved us. And Father, we pray that we will be your image bearers as we interact with society. So your son's holy name we pray. Amen. For communion, if you could, turn your Bibles over to Colossians chapter 3. Starting in verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since, you're, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's surely chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We see that verses 5 through 9 talks about sins of omission and sins of commission. But then in verse 10, the more that we have an opportunity to truly understand the love of God, his love for us, that he wants to be in fellowship with us, that he wants to use us to be a part of his plan, we can put on our new self. As we commune today, I want us to think about being compassionate, being kind, being humble, being gentle, being patient, forgiving, and loving. As we have a chance to commune with God, that's the type of people, that's the image bearer that God wants us to be. Let's pray. Dear Father God in heaven, thank you so very much for this opportunity to commune with you through your son. We're so grateful 
that we have your word. We're so grateful that we have your son who is a living example of the people that we should be. And Father, we want to be compassionate, kind, and humble. We want to be gentle, patient, forgiving, and loving. And Father, we want to love you, but also we want to love others the way that you've loved us. As we take this communion, as we take this bread, which is your son's broken body, your son's broken body that was beaten so that we have this opportunity to put on our new selves. As we take this fruit of the vine, which is your son's blood, that continues to wash away our sins, the sins of omission and the sins of commission, understanding that we're going to blow it and mess up. But because of your son's blood, we have been forgiven and our sins are washed away. Help us to never take this opportunity in vain. We love you. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. afternoon or well, good late morning. Thank you, Mike, for that uh, message of uh, encouragement. And I want to start off with uh, what Mike's been talking about in Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 6. This is a call to repentance. I am the Lord and I do not change. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading from the NLT. That, that is why your descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When do we ever cheat you? 
you have cheated me of the tithes and offering due me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me, bringing all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the windows of heaven, for you I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it and put it to the test. When Mike shared about uh, discernment, if you need money for a medical procedure, your lights might be about to get cut off, God wants you to take care of that because that's a responsibility that you accepted when you signed that and had using their lights and power. And then he used the other analogy of you're going to have a Super Bowl party and you want to buy that big screen TV because you want to <laughs> look good uh, in people's eyes. And I thought about uh, that discernment part uh, in robbing God. Have I made those kind of decisions? I surely have. And, and a call to repentance is just change. Don't do it any longer. Use discernment and wise decision. Honor God with your wealth because he, he's the one that allowed you to be able to, to have it. Here uh, about a month ago or two, uh, my wife and I, me, I have a business and my business suffered because my uh, tow truck business, my truck had broke down. And uh, when Mike shared uh, about being in a family group or having uh, friends and relationships, I thought about how great God is that Gail and I have been afforded that. And so have you. When we were in need, or even when we weren't in need, God sent things our way. I left home this morning and I had to go down to the freezer to get something and it was full. I went to the refrigerator and it was plenty. I went to my bank account and it wasn't all that great, but it was something there. Something if I needed it, God has provided it. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, 1 and 2. I just want to share with you, uh, when you honor God and put him first, by this message that Paul had wrote down for the Corinthians, he said, starting in verse 1, now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collection will have to be made. That's thinking ahead of the game. You know, honoring God, put his off to the side first. And I thank God I have a wife that that's been her conviction for many years. And I had to uh, come to get to that point. But he put someone in my life that would help me get there. And that was my wife. So we've been devoted uh, with being in need and having a lot. We always had, thank God, money to give back to God, to honor him with our wealth. Whether it was, whether it, like Paul, whether it was a lot or little, we still made that conviction. Let's go to God and pray. God, we just thank you for the privilege to be able to give back what you have given us. And to use the sermon and be wise in trusting you to give today out of our hearts 10% or more and see how you will open up the floodgates, how you will take care of our needs, how you will never allow us to go hungry or, or, or have a clothing on our back or a roof over our head. You have given us all those things. God, and we're just so grateful that we're able to give back to you. And I pray that what's collected today, God, that you will just bless it and bless the hearts of those that give. We pray and ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
Hey, y'all, again. Thank y'all so much for joining us. Hey, everyone out in Facebook land, everyone streaming. We are so excited to have y'all here with us this Sunday. Thank you to all the new faces, all the returning faces, and all the faces we have not seen in a while. We are so excited to have y'all here. I am Gabby Dingle, and I have your announcements for today, Sunday, February 20th. All right, let's get into it. All right, today, we back on the east side. We on the east side. Hey. Next Sunday, we will be having our HBCU Sunday service, and we are inviting all campuses to join us. Social distancing will be in place, along with the use of masks for all attendees. We ask that all planning to attend, please register online prior to Sunday service. The registration link will be sent to Bridge Group leaders. It will be online, and if you get those alerts from BPC, you will get it sent directly to your phone. And if you did not get an opportunity to send in your HBCU or Divine Nine apparel, we are so sorry, but we are no longer accepting, what are they called? Um, submissions, that's it. But y'all, please hold on to your pictures for next year and be sure to wear your HBCU and D9 stuff to church next Sunday. If you got the dates mixed up and you wore your HBCU stuff at any other point this month, we love it, okay? Because we black every day, all day, all the time. So we love it. Kids Point is back, but we're seeking more volunteers for our teaching rotations. We're hoping to find six new volunteers for each campus service. If you would like to sign up, please reach out to Sherry Day at 404-630-1010. Men in White is back. Y'all, I'm so excited about Men in White. Yes, okay. Okay, Men in White. We will hold our first meeting of the year today at 3 p.m. via Zoom. Men in White is a men's accountability group geared towards helping young and mature men so sixth grade and up, understand and master their sexual purity. But this year, MIW will be expanding its focus to help men recognize and address the wide variety of sins they may combat in their personal lives. If you would like to virtually attend or learn more, please contact Jarrell Jones at 404-936-5770 and visit the BP site for the Zoom link. Are there any teens here right now? Any teens, where y'all at? Okay, teens. Okay, teens. BBC teens, please join us for our teen huddle directly after service in the sanctuary, stage left in the back. So back there, right? Here. JK, it's over there. Oops. For an opportunity to reflect on today's message, a fellowship, and discuss upcoming events. This will only take about 10 minutes, so please hurry to the huddle once service ends. And y'all do not rely on my directions, okay? It's going to be out that way can you escape we finna be trapped y'all can you escape well not all of us the teens you trapped can you escape bbc teens ministry will be hosting some escape room fun next sunday february 27th from 12 to 1 30 p.m at project escape atlanta located in marietta the first 10 teens to rsvp will receive a 50 percent discount for admission y'all we stand a discount okay first 10 teens 50 percent off so be sure to RSVP by Wednesday, February 23rd, that's this Wednesday, by contacting the rights at 260-239-2094. We hope to see you there. Thank you to all the members and guests who contribute financially each week. Your generosity is a blessing. And without you, our church wouldn't have the opportunity to impact this ministry or influence our community. Join us on Sunday, May 1st to celebrate our church anniversary and to hear me sing the classic anniversary because I'm going to sing it. We thank all of you who've already given and we're so appreciative of you and your hearts to sacrifice. All of your giving helps BPC to support local, regional, and international needs. Thank you to Brother AC for giving us such a convicting contribution message. Y'all remember that we have three ways to give. You can either mail your check or money order directly to 285 Victory Drive. You can hit that Give tab online at www.bridgepoint.life. Or you can text your desired amount to 678-257-3277. Are you a Bridgepoint member? Get access to premium content, content and important updates by creating your member account today. Just click the login button on the website menu and sign up with an existing email, Gmail, or Facebook account. 
Be sure to fill out the membership form once your account request has been accepted. Feel free to contact info at bridgepoint.live if you have any questions or need assistance. And like I said, y'all, um, if you have already signed up to get those alerts, you are already in the know. If not, it is not too late. Y'all stay connected. If you would like to receive text alerts for church news and updates, just text BPC411 to 678-647-9757. Now our elder exec, exec elder, however you want to put it, however you want to say it, Elder Rankin is coming up to close us out. We love y'all much. Y'all stay up and we'll see you next week. All right, all right. Thank you, Sister Dingo, for that amazing choice of announcements today. She is amazing with the announcements. I really like that. And she said she's going to be singing on the, the uh, anniversary. So maybe the giving will go up because you're going to be singing that day, okay? Maybe. Just hope it don't go down. So, but what an amazing service we had today. We want to thank everybody who participated today. Absolutely. Man. Deacon A.C. Cheeks, amazing, brother, on the uh, contribution. I think I'll give an extra $5 today because of that, what you just did today. Thank you so much. Y'all can join me on that as well. Uh, and also, too, want to thank an amazing, incredible message today by our pastor, Mike Pope, today. Man. I mean, we need to know so much about not just who we are, but whose we are and who we are to look like in the world. And we need to be our God's image bearers in the world. There should be no doubt about when people see us who we belong to. Amen? Amen. So we thank him so much for that amazing, incredible message today. We look forward to all the messages that we have coming this year on repentance and each and everything. Our renewal, renew in 2022. Are you ready to get renewed? All right, okay, some of y'all are, some of y'all kind of, you know, getting behind, but that's all right. By the time it's over, we'll all be renewed by, by December, amen? Amen, we got all year to do that. Um, and so with that being said, you know, we also want to thank everybody who joined us online. I know we had a few issues, but, the, you know, things happen. Uh, but just thank, thanks for, for hanging in there with us and uh, waiting for everything to come back up. We want to thank the AV team. They do an amazing, incredible job, our... You know, I'm, I'm up there hounding them every Sunday before service starts to try to get everything right. But they, they allow me to come up and do it. They have not thrown me off the thing up there yet, so thank you so much, my brothers, for doing that, for being patient with me. Uh, and so they do an amazing job. And also, too, you know, this person never gets it. Dana, our cameraman down here. Thank you so much, my brother. He keep, he keep us visual up here, so we thank him as well. And so uh, this week, we got challenges. Uh, Mike shared those challenges, those questions for us this week. I love watching Facebook because people respond on there. There were so many amens and hearts and stuff going up today. It was, people enjoyed it at home too, so it's always great to see that as well. And so this week, let us be about being image bearers of God this week, all right? When we get out there, it will be no doubt about who we are and whose we are, amen? With that being said, let us all stand for our final prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we, we come once again. And we come before you as humble as we know how. Father, we are so, so grateful that you have been so good to us this week. Despite what we may have went through this week, here we are. You woke us up this morning. You allowed us to lay down last night. It was nothing that we did. It was all because of you. You led us here safely today so that we would be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Now, Father, we understand that we are worshiping different now than we had a couple years ago. We are not quite filled up yet, but God, we're filled up on the inside of our hearts. And we thank you for, for bringing us this far. And God, I ask that you would continue to watch over us. Help us to be who we need to be for you. Help us to be who we need to be here in this world. That we need to be image bearers. That there would be no doubt in anyone's mind when they see us, they see a picture of you. 
so grateful for you, how you have taken care of us and how you've taken care of this church. We love you, Father. And we only know how to love you because you loved us first. Thank you so much for all you have done and all that you are going to do. We ask, Father, that you would be with those who are sick, those of us who are among us who are sick. It may be someone here that may be going through something right now, Father. Just give them a little kiss right now. Let them know that you know, that you, that you see them, that you hear their prayers. And, Father, those who are in hospital beds, go into those rooms right now and heal those broken bodies. And for the family members who are going through it as well, and Father, we ask that you would be with them. Give them strength to stand up underneath whatever it is they may be facing right now. Father, we ask that you would be with those who lost loved ones. God, mend their broken hearts. Comfort them and help us to comfort them like you comforted us in our time of bereavement. And so Father, we, we want to just do your will. We want to be better. We want to be in a repentant state of mind because, Father, we want to be renewed this year. We want to be refreshed this year. We want to be better for you. We want to be better for you than we've ever been. Help us, O oh Lord. Help our spirits to move and not to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority from this day forevermore. And the people of God and the church of God say amen, amen, amen again. Thank you so much for coming. spending this time with us today. Like Matthew 18, 20 tells us, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. So we know God was all up in here today. To hear more sermons, get announcements, special events info, and any other church information, visit our website at bridgepoint.life. If you're looking for a church home, please don't hesitate to contact us on any of our social media platforms including Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Bridgepoint ATL. If you are in need of prayer or would like to get a call from someone on our ministry team, you can also do this through social media. May God bless you and keep you. You have been listening to the broadcast by BPC. We are located at 285 Victory Drive Southeast, Marietta, Georgia, 30060. We look forward to having you here with us again each and every Sunday at 10 a.m.